sometimes even going on vacation, sometimes it doesn't feel restful. And our lives can be so busy and so bombarded with things of, of stress and anxiety. It could be family issues. It could be work issues. It could be health issues. Any of those number of things. But David said that Jesus, our shepherd, he maketh me to lie down in green pastures, and he leadeth me beside the still waters. The Bible says in Isaiah 53, 6, that all we like sheep have gone astray, and we've turned uh, everyone to his own way. The fact is, we have learned that sheep do not just naturally take care of themselves. Sheep need a shepherd. May I say to you, as a body of believers, as Christians, we need a shepherd too. Uh, we need Jesus Christ to lead us and to guide us. And as the flock of God, uh, uh, we need uh, 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 attention and we need meticulous care just like sheep do. The Bible says that all of us have gone astray. All of us have violated God's word. All of us have done things that are unholy. All of us had had, have had unholy thoughts. All of us had have, uh, have had unrighteous deeds. All of us know that we deserve death. We haven't earned a spiritual life. But Jesus came to this earth. He came uh, born of a virgin. He was God in the flesh. And Jesus came to this earth, lived a sinless life. And Jesus declared... I am the good shepherd, and here's what I love. I laid down my life for the sheep. What Jesus has said to you and I and has declared to the entire world, I know that you're a mess, but I have come here to give my life for you and straighten it out. And I'm thankful for that. Jesus has clearly displayed that we are a mess and that we need guidance and that we need a shepherd. And Jesus Christ gave his life on the cross so that we could come into his family and then belong to him. That's what David is boasting on. That's what he says in verse 1. He says, the Lord is my shepherd. And I want to submit to you that we know that the shepherd is a good shepherd because the good shepherd provides rest. Let me say that again. Jesus Christ is the good shepherd because Jesus Christ provides rest. What does Jesus provide, church? He provides what? Come on, say it again. He provides what? Now, Jay, you took a nap all day. You slept all afternoon. That's what he told me before the service. I said, how'd your afternoon go? He says, I slept all afternoon. I'm not talking about that kind, although that's good. If you got that, amen to you. I, my first question was, how in the, what in the world did you do with your son? He said, he slept right with me. He slept the whole, I'm like, amen. I hope you'll be able to sleep tonight. That boy's going to be wide open. And uh, probably, maybe he'll sleep good tonight out too. I don't know. This is not what necessarily we're talking about. Sheep are naturally restless animals. They are very fearful and skittish. And uh, I'm going to say that that may describe a few of you tonight here. Uh, uh, I, I am restless in my sleep. Uh, the, the, uh, the other night, uh, it might have been Friday night, I don't know, uh, I do all kinds of things in my sleep. And uh, uh, I, don't, I don't use the wrong words in my sleep. Amen. I'm a Christian even in my sleep. I'm thankful for that. And uh, I praise the Lord for that. But the other night, man, I just woke up laughing. And uh, I don't know what I was laughing. Sometimes I wake up fighting. Uh, sometimes I wake up with the big eyes, you know, like, I mean, something's going on. You know, hey, are you all right? Because uh, you look weird. And uh, I scare my family sometimes when they startle me when I wake up. And, uh, but, but, but I, I don't sleep all that well and always tossing and turning and stuff like that. And, uh, but David says about the life of the good shepherd, he says this, notice in verse two, he maketh me to lie down in green pastures. This is a picture of a flock lying down in total peace, uh, lying down in total rest and tranquility, trans, uh, tranquility. And here's the reason why. Because the sheep know that they are in the care of the good shepherd. 
Now, you may not be able to sleep because of health reasons. You, you may not be able to sleep because uh, a friend of ours uh, has um, uh, restless leg syndrome. I think that's what it's called. Uh, uh, you, know, you may have a medical condition. Uh, outside of that, I want you to know that money cannot buy peace. Money can't buy rest. But Jesus Christ, the good shepherd, can provide peace to those who are at unrest. And difficult times come. Sheep are very timid and they're easily panicked. And I told you this one uh, last time, and, and, and Taylor, you would pr appreciate this being a rabbit hunter. A rabbit can, just one rabbit can make a whole flock of sheep stampede. Just one rabbit. And, and, and as small as a rabbit is, it can, it can literally uh, uh, a stampede. Uh, one of our, our daughters, uh, Leah, uh, Leah, is, uh, Leah is skittish. Leah is easily um, frightened. You, you can look at our daughter. I mean, I, I have been sitting at the table looking at them and go boo and they literally will spill their milk I, I mean it has happened before and and uh, she's very skittish and she can be talking to you and you can do it and she'll jump and uh, so it, it, she's just one of those uh, kinds of kids or, or people that are easily skittish and, and so she she's kind of carries herself that way and, and it doesn't it's not a bad thing it's just it's just a another way of letting us know that at our time at times in our life this can describe us this at times can be true in all of our lives that as like sheep we have problems that bring agitation in our lives or we have problems that bring anxiety and sometimes they stem from insecurities or inward fears but sometimes they they come from friction in our external relationships with others and like Leah I mean it, 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 it's friction it's a it's a scared thing I I didn't know you were going to do that I, I was uncertain of what you were going to do and but do you know that Christ desires to give you and I rest? That's what God wants for you and I. He wants us to rest. Now, I'm not talking about sleeping, snoring rest. I'm talking about God wants us to rest in Him. In other words, God wants us to rest and abide in the sufficiency of Jesus Christ. Rest in His strength. Rest in His hope. Rest in the sufficiency of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Not rest and get worked up all the time about your life and your, and, and, and your, your issues and the things that you have in your life, although you can't avoid those. But when they come, as a Christian, God is saying, I will provide through the trials and through the difficulties and through the anxiety and, and through the uh, tumultuous times in your life, Jesus is letting us, through me, as your good shepherd, I will provide the rest for you that you need through those times. See, the fact is, in John chapter 14, verse 27, the Bible says that, that Jesus says, uh, Peace I give unto you. This world has much trouble, but, uh, but I give you peace, and, and, and I leave you with peace. And, and, and Jesus is letting us know that, that we can either have the world's trouble, or we can have the peace of Christ in our life. And there are times when we are troubled, and, and the word trouble means to stir up or agitate. You ever gotten agitated by something? Has someone ever agitated you? Better yet, have you ever agitated someone? You know, someone said, hey, I had one nerve and you got on it. Amen? Man, we, we can be that way, and we can be that way with others. But, but I love what Jesus said. And I want you to keep a bookmarker in Psalm 23. We've got to come right back there. May I remind you what Jesus said in Matthew 11. Would you look at that one time? Stay in Psalm 23, a bookmark or something. Hold a place there. We'll come right back to Psalm 23. But look at Matthew 11. And look at verses 28 and 29. 
And listen, listen to the words of Jesus here. Boy, I like this. But look at the invitation that Jesus gives. Uh, look, at the, look at the invitation that He's offering. Come unto me, you know the verse, all ye that labor and are heavy laden. Man, you got a lot on you. Man, you're, you're carrying a big load. Man, it could be mentally, it could be physically, it could be emotionally. Jesus is talking to you and He says, Come and I will give you rest. Verse 29. But I also want you to know, I want you to take my yoke. I want you to take what I'm going to give you. And I want you to put that upon you and, and I want you to learn of me. I want to teach you something. For I am meek and lowly in heart and ye shall find rest in your souls. Here's what I find in Scripture. Jesus is in the exchange business. Jesus likes to ex exchange things with you and I. And here's what I love about it. It's always for your betterment and my betterment. Jesus takes your sins, my sins, and exchanges it with his righteousness. <laughs> That's a, that is an unbelievable deal. I, why? Because he loves me and you. And he's a good shepherd. He takes your heaviness, your stress, your worries, whatever the case may be. And by the way, every person worries. And given the right circumstance, given the right issues, everyone stresses out at times. Get a little hot under the collar. Get a little burr in the saddle. All of us can get that way, but Jesus says, Hey, are you, you, are you done throwing that fit? You good? Got that out? I would rather you have come to me. And here's what I would have done. I would have exchanged that. I would have took that from you. And I would have given you something else, but through that, not only would you have learned something, I would have given you rest for your soul, for your inner man, for your inner person. I'm going to give you rest inside of you I know the world around you may be in turmoil I know it may be upside down but inside of you I will give you rest boy I love that will you come to the Good Shepherd and will you allow him to take care of you I want to give you a second thing tonight not only will the Good Shepherd give you and provide for you rest but if you go back to Psalm 23 I'd like to give you the second part of Psalm 23 verse 2 he says he maketh me to lie down in green pastures he leadeth me beside the still waters let's say that part the end of verse 2 where it begins with he leadeth me let's say that together ready to begin he leadeth me beside the still Still waters. Let me tell you the second thing that the Good Shepherd provides, and that is contentment. He provides contentment. Not just rest, but contentment. I love this. I love running. Well, I love to hear water running. Unfortunately, it may have you frequent the uh, restroom, all right? But I love running water. I love to hear the ocean. That's the reason you go to the ocean. Whether you ever get in it, I, uh, I don't even care to get in the ocean anymore. Maybe ankle deep. Man, I used to go way out there. Man, I used to take our kids out there. Melissa would stay on the beach, and I used to go way out in the ocean with our kids. Man, I'd throw them up in that water, and I wouldn't catch them. No, I'd catch them. And I'd catch them, and, they, they, you know, we would wait. I would turn my back to the wave. And so they could see it coming, but I couldn't. And so I would just act like, you know, everything's good. And they're like, Dad, it's coming. And so I could feel them getting tighter, you know what I mean? And they would get tighter, and I'm like, don't. And then they would start going around the neck, you know? And I'm like, you gotta, you got to stop that. I mean, i got to breathe. And because if I go down, hey, man, if the ship goes down, buddy, you got a problem. And, and so we would go way out there, and Melissa would be like, come on back. You're way out there too far. Until we went up on the top floor of one of those penthouses 
that are right above the ocean. And when you go up about, I don't know if it was 28 floors, about 28 floors or something, and, um, and you can see in that water, let me tell you something, uh, there were some guests all around your feet that you had no idea that were there. And after seeing that, I just decided, you know what, I'd rather be in a swimming pool where I can see the bottom. And uh, well, I know there's nothing in there, but I love to hear the ocean. I love to hear that water. I love to go to a waterfall. Man, I love going and hearing that water running over. And, and uh, you know, you can even, man, I'll tell you what, I love noise when I go to bed. How, how many of you like to sleep and it's quiet? I mean, you got to have it still. Not, you don't even want to hear a cricket. All right, how many of you like noise when you sleep? You, you got, yeah, amen. See, I, I like to have noise. Melissa's the opposite. She wants it quiet. Man, when it gets quiet, I start panicking. Like, like I start listening to everything. Man, I can, hear, I can hear the light turn on. I mean, I, I'm just, I'm thinking about everything. I'm hearing about the car door opening at the next door neighbor. You know, I'm like, why are they getting in so late? You know, I mean, the garage door opening somewhere else. I, I, I mean, just, I, I just think way too much stuff. And so I need some noise to kind of drown everything. You know, you can get apps and put them on your phone. Man, you can play those things. You know, you can get a water app, a rainfall app. Boy, you can just, man, it's just so soothing. But David said, he leadeth me beside still waters. It's not rough waters. And sometimes, you know what your life is like? Man, it's like you're on rough waters. Man, you are tossed to and fro. I don't know if you've ever been out in the deep sea. Uh, out when we lived in Daytona Beach, I had the opportunity several times to, to go out. And you'd go out in the jetties and you could... Uh, we'd go out and we'd go deep sea fishing a little bit and uh, had a friend of mine who had a boat and, and uh, so we could go. Um, you know, you'd, get, you'd just get a few miles offshore, man. It was a different world and sometimes we'd get 20 miles out and um, that's a long ways. But when them storms come and boy, that alarm starts going off on that, that, that radio. Uh, I, I don't know. I don't drive a boat. I don't know anything about that stuff. But when he said, I need you to reel it in, pack it in, bat, bat in the hatches, make sure everything is secure. We got to go. I'm like, the sun is out, man. I said, what are you talking about? He says, I know, but there's a storm coming, and if we don't get in, he says, I won't be able to get to the dock. We will get beat up so bad. And by the time we got to the jetties and through, man, it was six to seven foot swells. And I want to tell you something, it felt like someone was underneath that boat with a bulldozer just ramming that boat. I thought the boat was going to come apart. So I'm watching him. Well, if he wasn't going to freak out, I wasn't going to freak out. But when he started getting nervous and started kind of licking his lips and, you know, holding on with the, that, that wheel, that steering wheel. I don't even call it a steering wheel. And, uh, man, I started getting nervous. I'm like, are we going to be all right? He says... You better start praying. I said, man, I prayed before we left the dock. <laughs> you better get this boat in. And, uh, but I'll tell you what, those waves were just something. You know what, our whole life is like that. Waves can just hit and just pound that boat. But David said, he leadeth me beside the still waters. I want to share this with you and draw the anal analogy of this. We are like sheep. And sheep require water. Now hang on with me. I'm not talking about just H2O, although we are right now. We're going to draw it spiritually. In fact, their health and their vitality and their strength and their vigor, uh, they all depend on an ample supply of water. They have to have copious amounts of water. When sheep are thirsty... They become restless and set out in search of water to satisfy that thirst. If they aren't led to good, clean water supplies, here's what they end up doing. They will go, sheep now will go, and they will start drinking from polluted potholes, water holes, where they will pick up internal parasites and disease and germs. 
But the shepherd is the one who knows where to find the clean, giving water, and he knows where it can be found. And they must trust the true shepherd. And as they trust the shepherd, they know that he will lead them to the place of life and refreshment. May I say to you, we have a physical body and we need water to survive. But you also are a spiritual person. And you need spiritual water because we are spiritually thirsty. And we need spiritual water. Unfortunately, Satan knows this and he knows that there are a lot of water holes that are full of parasites, of disease and germs, and Satan will try to attempt and lead you and I outside of the shepherd's care, outside of his guidance, that we will get ahead of him and we will not wait on him, we will not rest in him, and we will become antsy and we will become uh, full of uh, stress and anxiety to the point that we will try to go and drink and quench our own thirst in the wrong watering hole. And the most obvious watering hole that Satan provides, of course, is sin. But there also is maybe a mud hole, if you will, of education. People get so smart, they think they're smarter than God. There is the watering hole or the mud hole of money. People get so convinced and satisfied within themselves that they don't think they need God. But I want to submit to you that I believe that maybe one of the favorite water holes of Satan is the mud hole of religion. Many people are drinking from these mud holes hoping to find inner contentment. People will go to religion and try to satisfy themselves spiritually by some type of performance, by some type of, uh, of earning favor with God or whom they think is God instead of going to the true source, the watering source, or going to the good shepherd who will lead them to the right source that will satisfy their thirst. And when we do this, and we decide not to trust the good shepherd we become unsatisfied. And although those mud holes may bring temporary pleasure, but just like with a sheep, dirty water brings nothing but more problems. And I'm going to tell you, all week long, people are drinking from a dirty water source. And every Sunday and Wednesday, you know what we're trying to do? We're trying to provide a clean water source for them. A water source that's spiritual, that is clean, that's unpolluted, that will satisfy their thirst. You know, Jesus said, if any man thirsts, let him come. And Jesus is offering you and I, every time we open this book, you know what he's at? He's offering a clean drink of water. He's offering to us clean spiritual water. Do you know that there's a place where you can find spiritual water that is clean and refreshing? Would you leave Psalm 23, keep a bookmarker there, and go with me to the book of John. And I'd like for you to look at the Gospel of John, John chapter 4. I'd like to point this out to you. Remember, Jesus, the Good Shepherd, He provides contentment. I wonder where do you go to get satisfied every week? Where do you go to get satisfied in your own life? John chapter 4. Look at verse 9. I want you to look at verse 9 through 14. John chapter 4. We find here clean, refreshing, spiritual water. Look at this story here. John chapter 4, verse 9, Then saith the woman, you know this story probably. He goes through Samaria and he meets a woman. They're at a well. The scene is at a, a drinking, watering well. Jesus says to the woman of Samaria unto him, 
How is it thou, or, or then said the woman, excuse me, how is it thou being a Jew, because he asked her, give me a drink of water, she says, how is it that you ask me, a Samaritan, uh, give me a drink of water, which I'm a woman of Samaria, for the Jews have no dealings with Samaritans. So how does this conversation even begin, sir? Verse 10, Jesus answered and said unto her, If thou knewest the gift of God, and who it is that saith to thee, Wow, give me to drink, thou wouldest have asked of him, and he would have given us the living water. Did you notice that? If you only knew who was talking to you, and if you only knew what kind of provision has been made, you wouldn't have waited for me to ask you for water. You would have asked me when I showed up, Sir, can you give me living water? Man, what a powerful statement. Verse 11. The woman said unto him, Sir, thou hast nothing to draw with. Again, she missed the spiritual part. Thirsty, yet she's been drinking from the wrong water source. You don't even have anything to draw with. And the well is deep. From whence then hast thou that living water? How can you give me water? Art thou greater than our father Jacob? So she knew a little bit of religion. She knew a little bit of history. Are you better than Jacob? Which giveth and gave us the well and drank thereof himself and his children and his cattle. Are you better than those before us? Jesus answered and said unto her, Well, whosoever drinketh of this water shall thirst again. But whosoever drinketh of the water that I shall give him shall never thirst. But the water that I shall give him shall be in him a well of water springing up into everlasting life. Wow. I love that story. See, Christ is the good shepherd. He's the only good shepherd. And he made it clear that the thirsty souls of men and women can only be fully satisfied when uh, their thirst for spiritual life is fully quenched by drawing on it from Jesus. To drink in the Bible simply means to take in, accept, and believe. And so when you take in the Bible, and when you take this in spiritually, and when you take this in daily, what you are doing is you are going to the ultimate life-giving resource of Jesus Christ. You are going to the ultimate satisfying well of Jesus. When David said the Lord is his shepherd, and he leads him beside the still waters, he is saying that the Lord is the one who knows where the still, quiet, deep, clean, pure water is to be found. Then Jesus came along and said, as we know in his earthly ministry, I am the good shepherd and I am the living water which all are in one. Jesus said, living water is found in me. I want to submit to you, you can look for contentment in money, you can look for contentment in your material possessions, you can look for contentment in your physical pursuits. You can look for contentment in sinful activities. You can look for contentment in fame and power, etc. But the living water that satisfies is only found in one place. And that is with the Good Shepherd. And that is with Jesus Christ. When you drink in Christ... In other words, when you accept Him and believe on Him, the very Spirit of Christ comes to live within you, and you and I have an endless supply of life-giving water to draw on for the rest of your life and my life. If week to week you struggle, listen to me, if you struggle week to week living the victorious Christian life, and I'm not saying that life doesn't have some curveballs and that, and that we are perfect. What I'm saying is if you find yourself habitually struggle, struggling to live the Christian life, I'm going to say you're at the wrong watering source. I'm going to say you're not intaking with Jesus enough or at all. 
We can make excuses. We, we can try to circumvent the whole issue. But it really goes back to this. If we are saved, we are spirit beings, folks. And if we are spirit beings, we need to be spirit fed. Which means we need the food and nourishment of Jesus Christ. Would you look at, you're in John still, hopefully. Look at John chapter 7 and look at verse 38. Boy, I like this. Verse 38 of John 7. He that believeth on me, as the Scriptures hath said, out of his belly shall flow rivers of living water. Doesn't that go back to what Colossians 2.10 says, and ye are complete in him? We lack nothing in Jesus does that not go back and, and correlate and correspond with Psalm 23, 1, where David said, The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. I don't know about if you like to watch Survivor shows or anything like that, but, but uh, we've caught a few episodes. But here, here's one thing that I know is needful. You got to have water. And here's what I have found. Those people on those shows, they will drink from some of, they will pour, get water from some of the nastiest watering holes. I don't mean to be graphic, but I have seen them take water from watering places where animals have been in. And they are taking baths and doing their business in there. You know what I mean? And they get that water, and they got to have water. They're starving for water. But here's what I do see them do. You never see them drink that water as it is. You know what they do? They get it clean. And I'm saying to you is that just because you are drinking does not mean you are taking in clean water. God is letting us know you and I need to have clean spiritual water and that comes from Christ. Sheep are stubborn and when they get thirsty they will drink from any water source that they find. When they are desperate they will not wait on their shepherd. They will start drinking. They aren't testing the water they aren't seeing if it's clean. As long as it's some type of liquid, they will drink it. It doesn't matter where it comes from. And at the, whole, at the exact same time, they are getting disease and germs and parasites. And that's why the shepherd watches his sheep closely and moves them from place to place. Because even the sheep will contaminate their own water. The same water they drink from is the same water they go to the bathroom in. And so he will have to move them from time to time and make sure that they are in the right source of water for their life. And I'm saying to you as a Christian, you be careful what you take in. It may be liquid, it may be cool, but it doesn't mean it at always from Jesus. That's why we must make sure that we guard ourselves when it comes to spiritual things. Not everything on the religious channel is right. Not everything that the Christian bookstore sells on the sh uh, sh uh, uh, sales on the shelves are right. That's why you must be in God's Word and search the Scriptures as a Berean to make sure those things are so. That's why it's important for you and I to rightly divide God's Word. Why? We want to make sure we are drawing from the right. We are drawing from the right water source. So we are drinking good spiritual nourishment. I'd like for you to go back to Psalm 23. And I'd like for you to look at verse 3. Psalm 23 is all about the good shepherd and his care. 
He says in verse 1, The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He maketh me to lie down in green pastures. He leadeth me beside the still waters. Notice this. He restoreth my soul. He leadeth me in the paths of righteousness for his name's sake. He restoreth my soul. As a sheep, David is boasting of how wonderful it is to belong to the good shepherd. Jesus declared, as I've said before, I am the good shepherd, and the good shepherd giveth his life for the sheep. I want to submit to you and say to you, friend, that there is nothing like being under the good care of Jesus Christ. Why in the world would you and I as Christians graze on the barren pastures of Satan and what this world has to offer when we can be under the constant care of a good shepherd. If you have never yielded your life to Christ, that's what you must do. That's called the Lordship of Christ. Giving Him a total reign of your life. It means taking your hands off the steering wheel, if you will, and giving Christ total control. Here in Psalm 23, David is boasting of the benefits of the Good Shepherd. And I want you to once again to look at verse 3. We've covered verse 1 and 2. And just by way of introduction, notice, He restoreth my soul. I asked you earlier, have you ever had times in your life where things were difficult, where life was up and down? I love this because David said he restoreth my soul. That indicates that his soul was at one point, but then at another point it was somewhere else. Not that he lost his salvation, that's not what this is referring to. It just means that there had to be a renewing. I want to submit to you that the circumstances of life can knock you down. Job 14.1 says, Man that is born of woman is a few days and full of trouble. But when we're talking about the good shepherd, verse 3, He restoreth my soul. I want to say to you, with the good shepherd, He's always there to pick you up when you fall. He provides rest and contentment, but He also is there to pick you up when you fall. I don't know if you remember when your kids were so small, right between the time where they were beginning to stand up and take that first step. And they were, uh, they were uneasy on their feet. I mean, they couldn't stand up for you. They were staggering. They would grab a hold of an end table or maybe a chair or a couch or something. And everyone in the room, if you were there, and, and everyone was waiting for that first step. And it was like, oh, wait, sir, he's, she's, whoa, he's going to do it. And then they'd fall on that bottom. Thank God for pampers, right? They're so thick and stuff, some cushion right there. You'd think after all those falls, that'd be pretty sore. They'd get up and they'd do it again. They'd get up and do it again. But they would get so frustrated and so hurt by the inability to do it on their own. What did your kid and my kids do when they realized this isn't going to work on my own? Pick me up. And you know what we do? Who cares if you can walk? I want to carry you. What I'm trying to get them to walk and take those first steps, do you realize once they take those first steps, they're off and running? And it's no more picking up, no more hold me. And it goes to the hands, hold hands, and now they'll barely hold hands with you. It's embarrassing. I make them hold my hand. But. Isn't that the way we are with Christ at times? That we can get cast down. We can fall down. We're just doing well and all of a sudden, 
kind of down. You know what Jesus is doing? He's, he's right there. Come on. I'm going to pick you up. A cast sheep is very pathetic. It's a very pathetic sight when you see a cast sheep. When you see a cast sheep, I don't know if you know this, but they can lie flat on their back. All four legs will be in the air. Well, that's a sight, isn't it? And they, the, the, it just their, their legs, they, they, they flay away frantically. They just move their legs frantically, struggling to stand up, only to do it without any success. Sometimes the sheep will even bleep. They, they will cry for help. I'm not going to attempt to do that for you. I know you're disappointed by that. But it's really pitiful. But generally it just lies there in frustration, unable to help itself. You know what it needs? It needs a shepherd who will come along and pick that sheep up and set it straight. If the shepherd does not arrive within a reasonable short time and restore that cast down sheep, you know what happens? The sheep dies because it cannot right itself and its intestines uh, literally turn basically to concrete. And they cannot, it will suffocate to death. And this is why the shepherd must keep track of his sheep. Because if one is missing, boy, off that shepherd goes to find and restore that sheep that is cast down elsewhere. And as you contemplate right now that sheep in your mind, on its back, frantically trying to get back on its feet. I wonder if that describes you and me in our life at times. Well, we may not physically be doing it, but maybe mentally, maybe emotionally, and maybe even spiritually. We are just frantically trying to get back and put the pieces together. Trying to just trying to get through the next moment. But as you look into the Bible, you find that this is true for even some of the greatest saints in God's Word. David, who is the writer of this psalm, certainly knew what defeat was. This guy had his own son try to murder him. He committed murder himself, David did. Committed adultery. The woman that he committed adultery with had a child. He died. His kingdom was wrecked. His testimony was ruined. And yet the Bible still says and records that he was a man after God's own heart. David was a man messed up. I'm thinking of Moses who ended up on the backside of a desert. A man who led the people of Israel and yet never saw the promised land. The Bible is full of people just like you and me who needs Jesus to come pick them up when they fall. I think of Daniel who the Bible says did as he always did. He was committed to his praying to God. He was faithful and he was committed. He was a being obedient. And where did it end him up? He ended up in the lion's den. Serving his king. He was cast down. I think of Samuel. Old Samuel. Samuel had some messed up sons. Here's a man who served God, who was supposed to be a mighty uh, 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 spokesperson and leader for God, 
And his sons were as wicked as they could be. They broke his heart. And what did they need? They need the same thing that you and I need. We need a good shepherd who will pick us up when we fall. Paul knew what it was to be cast down, did he not? The Bible says in 2 Corinthians 4, 8 and 9, that the Bible says that he knew what it was like to be perplexed. He knew what it was like to be uh, 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 cast down. He knew what it was like to be uh, uh, um, uh, stressed out. He knew what it was like to be hurt over and over. He knew what it was like to have problems and issues. But the Bible said, Paul says, yeah, our life is absolutely cast down, but it's not destroyed. I'm not destroyed through it. Why? Because he was in the care of Christ. He was in care of the great, the great shepherd. He, he says, man, I'm in the love of God. I, there is nothing that can separate me and you from the love that we find in Christ Jesus. Paul said, you know what? My life may just be a mess, but I know one thing that is right and will never change, and that is that Jesus loves me and he cares for me. And he will be here with me every step of the way. When we find ourselves cast down, you and I find, I find that Jesus is always there ready to restore. And I want you to remember that about your life. And I want you to remember that every time that you fail, but not just when you fail. I want you to remember that when you find it easy to judge the person beside you or next to you and your family, that also fails. That the same Jesus that will restore you and the same Jesus that takes care of you will take care of that rotten sinner too. It's the same God. It's the same loving, good shepherd that takes care of you will take care of them. If they will let him... Sometimes, Christ will work through another brother or sister to restore us when we are cast down. One final verse. Would you look at, you can leave Psalm for tonight. And would you go to Galatians chapter 6? Often we think, or maybe the world does, and maybe even in the church, that Christians are judgmental. And maybe sometimes we are. We certainly have no right to be because we are not the judge. God is the judge. Uh, man is, as the Bible says, we are men most miserable. We, we are a mess. But I do know there's one thing that we should be with each other. And look at Galatians chapter 6. Sometimes when we think of Christians and our brothers and sisters, we often think that they'll just judge us and find fault in us, and they may. I don't think that will be hard to find. But I find a greater principle in Scripture that the church ought to be with one another and with other brothers and sisters in Christ, and that is with the gift and the ministry of restoration. Look at verse 1. Brethren, talking to believers now. Paul wrote to churches. He's talking to Christians. Brethren, if a man be overtaken in a fault, you guilty of that? Yeah, you are. All of us are. You ever been overtaken? Yep, you have. Ye which are spiritual... Ye which are right with God, you that are walking with God and talking with God and living in spiritual victory and not in sin at the moment, ye which are spiritual, notice this, restore such a one in the spirit of meekness, not condemnation, but in love and in help. I mean, good night. Every one of us can point out the faults of others. You have them. Every Christian has warts. Why does everybody want to talk about the warts we have? You got problems, I got problems. 
All God's children have problems. That's why I need Jesus, because he doesn't have any problems, and he's the problem solver. And so we get all worked up and people got nothing nice to say in the church. You need some Galatians 6.1, my friend. And help me out. You want to straighten me out? Help me then. Because apparently you're more spiritual than me. Jesus said, ye that are spiritual, restore such a one. Notice this, he said, in meekness. Why? I mean, You've got to finish the rest of the verse. Hold on. Man, because this ain't just for the next guy. Man, this gets everyone. Consider thyself. Wow. Lest thou also be tempted. Hey, Mr. Religious, Miss Religious, before you start going around judging people, won't you get in the business of helping people? And while you're at it, you clean up your own backyard before you come in this playpen. Because I'm going to tell you something. I cannot take a study aid from you if you have failed the exam. Don't give me the answers to your test sheet. I want to study with the person who got a hundred. That's why I got through Spanish in high school. It's because Melissa helped me. I needed help. I couldn't get it. She got it. I didn't study with the morons I hung out with. Why? Because they were in uh, summer school with me. They didn't know any more than I did. Well, I'm not studying with you. You don't know anything. But Paul said, he said, if a man be overtaken in a fault, may not be, but if he is, so, I mean, it's possible, but it's also you could be wrong. But if he is, I don't see anywhere where it says you go and pl plaster it all over Facebook. You cut all that sinfulness out. And stop calling it a prayer chain. It's a bondage chain is what you got going. It's not a prayer chain. And you apply, ye that are spiritual, and you restore that one. You go and help. And I'm not here to talk about you. But I'm here to help you. Paul said, restore such a one. And that word restore literally means to set a broken bone. That's literally what it means. It means to set a broken bone. All of us have had times when we are like a cast sheep. And that's why the local church is so crucial. I'm not saying we have perfected it by any means. But that's why we are necessary and why we have to work at this. Because all of us have people that we love and care about. And there are people that love and care about you. But sometimes we can go through life when we find ourselves out of joint. We find ourselves cast down. We find ourselves defeated, discouraged. We find ourselves broken. And ye which are spiritual, restore such a one. May I say to you, that's one reason why you should stay spiritual and stay right with God, is so you can be in the position to help others. I have found that hurt people hurt others. But helped people help others. And that's why it's important for us to stay right with God, so we can help others who are wrong with God, or maybe wrong with others. And so what it has been broken, we can help mend. So we can help put back together. Every one of us have made bad choices. Every one of us have had issues in our life. And I thank God that there are people that can and will in your life and in my life be the ones that will say, hey, look, I've been where you are. I'm going to tell you that's not a good road to go down. 
I'd just like for you to consider your actions right now. But I also want you to know that it's not too late to turn around. It's not too late to get things right. It's not too late to make things right. Hey, let's do what's right, what pleases God. Here's what I love. Not only do you find rest and contentment in the good shepherd, but you find that he will pick you up when you fall down. Well, that's a good encouragement that you could give someone this week when they are going through a tough time. Hey, let's go to Psalm 23. Hey, let's go to Galatians 6. Hey, let's go to the scripture and then let's look how Jesus wants to help. I know you want to talk about it and I know you encouragement, but we find our consolation in Christ. And I just want to say to you that what you need is living water and I don't provide that. I can point you to it, but I'm not the provider of that. So let's get clean. Let's get right. Let's be in fellowship with God. And if we're in fellowship with God, we'll be in fellowship with one another. And through it, you will realize that the good shepherd wants to take care of you. With every head bowed and every eye closed. I pray tonight, Father, that we will realize how much of a good shepherd you really are. And God, that we will realize that we sure aren't perfect and we sure are not one to be judging. But we are certainly recognizing in our own life that we do fall down and that we often go astray but we're also reminded through the scriptures that it is used the good shepherd who takes care of us and leads us to green pastures who leads us beside still waters and restoreth our soul God, not only do you show us what's wrong in our life, but you also show us how to get right and how to stay right. And so, Lord, we're thankful for the good care of you. Lord, may we always point others to Jesus. May we not try to make up things or even uh, try to psychologically help people when really we can't even help ourselves, we must rest in the sufficiency of our Savior. May we always point people to Jesus. Because we ourselves need that very same care. We can't even care for ourselves. Left to ourselves just as sheep, we will literally destroy our own lives. And so God, thank you for this sweet psalm. Thank you for reminding us, even through David's life and others that we have examples of, who have had very difficulties in their life, yet they were committed to you. And here's what's more important. We find that you are committed to your children. You are committed and faithful to us. May we remember that when difficult times come. The Bible says that you'll never leave us nor forsake us. And that there is nothing in this world that can separate us from the love that is found in Christ Jesus. God, thank you for your word. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. I'm going to ask the ushers to come. and. Uh...